Hi, introducing Jessica Jordan, a behavioral change expert and coach with specialized training in neuro-linguistic programming. As the creator of Leap of Courage program for men struggling with porn addiction, Jessica's unique approach for focuses on rapid and last long in changes with working with different with the subconscious mind. With a background in health coaching, wilderness therapy, and neurobiological biology, Jessica's journey from recovering from neurological brain trauma to becoming a renowned expert featured in the Broken Brain documentary series is truly inspiring. So join us as the as, on the advisor with me, Stacey Chalemi, to learn more about Jessica's empowering story and her transformation work. Now, we've done several episodes. Jessica has a podcast on our channel. She is fabulous, and she is a she has a very high ranking audience because her 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 podcasts are truly amazing. So I suggest that you go check them out. And today she's going to talk about self-hypnosis. So I'm very excited to talk about this. And Jessica, like always, I love when you do your podcast. So it's great to see you today. So tell everybody a little about what you're thinking, what you want to do. Maybe tell them, people who haven't listened to you already, maybe tell them a little about yourself and then we'll go into the self-hypnosis thing. Absolutely. And I first wanted to say thank you for having me so I can I love having a platform to just speak about these things because they are so important for the human experience. And anybody who learns these things, no matter where you are in life, you are going to level up in ways that will help you overcome any challenge, no matter what the challenge. And so while I personally specialize in helping men overcome pornography addiction, Today's episode is going to be broad enough that it is for anyone and everyone, male, female, addiction, no, no addiction, trauma, no trauma, no matter where you are in life, these are some fundamental things to learn that when I teach them to my clients, they get angry that they didn't learn them in school as children because they're so easy to learn, easy to implement and life-changing in ways that make life easier for us. And today, what I want to focus on is something called self-hypnosis. And every single human being has already engaged in self-hypnosis with or without your awareness. It usually happens without your awareness. And it's something that we engage in every single day. And it's one of the things that is forming your identity and has formed your identity. And so I know that word hypnosis, a lot of people, most people have a really big misconception about what it actually is. Right. And that was me most of my life. A lot of people will say like, oh, my my mind is too strong to be hypnotized. I wouldn't fall for that. <laughs> and anyone saying that is just coming from a place of extreme lack of understanding. So I can first go into a little bit about the definition about what true hypnosis actually is, and that it's not something to ever be scared of, and that it's something that you already engage in every day. And so when you become more aware of it, you have more control of it. So you can guide and direct it to where you want it to be rather than your subconscious mind or life willy nilly uh, guiding you in a place that doesn't necessarily serve you. Right. And so essentially, let me give some examples of when our brain is in a hypnotic state because then it will help us realize, oh, I was doing that today. Oh, I did that yesterday. <laughs> <laughs> so for example, daydreaming. We've all daydreamed. Daydreaming is an example of when your mind has entered a hypnotic state and your subconscious mind is just kind of willy-nilly guiding it towards somewhere. Mm -hmm. And sometimes we may use our conscious mind to direct it a little bit, but it's more so our subconscious mind is taking over. It's called daydreaming for a reason. We're not sleeping, but it feels like a dream. And we don't necessarily have conscious awareness of where we physically are. Your mind is in a different location from your actual physical environment. And you 
you aren't really connected in the present moment with where you are around you, Mm -hmm. but your mind is somewhere totally else and you're just engaging. And it feels so real where your mind goes to feels so real that you begin to have an emotional response and epigenetic changes and neurochemical changes in your physical body as a result of where your mind went during the daydreaming. That's a form of self-hypnosis. We've all been there. Yeah. (laughs) Uh, Another example would be, we've all done this. Those of us who have our driver's licenses, we've all done this. When you're driving somewhere and you've done a certain route driving over and over and over and over, maybe on your drive back home from work, for example, and you're just on this autopilot, a lot of times our mind will actually go into a daydreaming state, or you might be thinking about something. You might be having a conversation with your, you know, in your mind about what you should have said to your boss that day instead, (laughs) (laughs) or whatever. We've all been in that state where we started driving from point A to point B. Mm -hmm. And all of a sudden you're like, wait, how did I end up here? I don't remember. I know there were three stop signs and at least one stoplight, but I don't really remember doing that, but I safely ended up here anyway. That's because your mind was in a hypnotic state elsewhere and your subconscious mind was just, uh, you know, the task of driving was so easy for you that it didn't take much cognitive um, effort for you to, it's not like, oh, let me put my my foot on the gas now. And we don't have to think about those things. It becomes so autopilot. So when we're in our autopilot activities, our mind tends to wander into a place of self-hypnosis. And so that's uh, some of the really common examples. Or if you've ever had an emotional response to any TV show or movie or song, we've all had emotional responses to those things. The moment you're engaged in it and you are captivated by it, Mm-hmm. even though if it's a TV show or a movie and you know, it's Hollywood, it's fake, you know, that little, you know, Timmy didn't really fall down the well. Yeah. Or, uh, you know, some of the things that we've cried at or laughed at, we know that it's all fabricated in Hollywood. And we know that, that, you know, the person in that movie didn't really die, but we begin crying or tearing up anyway. Right. Your subconscious mind does not know the difference between past, present, or future real or imaginary in the moment it believes it to be true. We have an emotional response inside of us. Now we have been hypnotized Mm -hmm. into believing that it's true, even though our conscious rational mind knows it's not true at all. Right. But our subconscious mind doesn't understand that. Mm -hmm. And so that is another form of self-hypnosis. I talk to my clients about this who are addicted to to pornography. Pornography is highly, highly hypnotic, Mm -hmm. highly hypnotic. The sexual experience is highly hypnotic. We are more open to suggestion in a hypnotic state. And so um, some other forms of hypnosis, if we've all done this as well, everyone who's ever had a smartphone, when you're scrolling your smartphone and your face goes deadpan, there's no really emotional expression. Yeah. You're actually in a hypnotic trance. And we've, we've all fallen into that. And we've all seen other people just mindlessly scrolling their phone. Yeah deadpan facial expressions but they're just scrolling 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 they are they have engaged and entered a hypnotic trance right and so these are just some of the common daily examples of when we are engaged in hypnosis and so we want to be really mindful about the music we listen to and the tv shows that we engage in because we it is affecting us on a subconscious level. It is our, affecting our mind and our brain and our thoughts and our stress responses. And even though our conscious rational mind says, yeah, that's not real. Our subconscious mind may believe that there really is a zombie apocalypse. Happening. Right. <laughs> <laughs> and now <laughs> you might feel, you know, oh man, I can't do horror movies anymore like I used to because I'll have to sleep with the lights on. My conscious <laughs> rational mind says, Jessica, you're an adult woman. Why would you, <laughs> this is so silly. And my subconscious mind goes, oh no, oh no. Don't you dare turn those lights off. <laughs> exactly, yeah. Oh, that's so funny. <laughs> and so that's kind of the lead in into a little bit more about what I want to talk to today about self-hypnosis. And the other form of self-hypnosis, which I haven't even mentioned yet, is 
one of the most important and powerful forms of hypnosis that exists for the human experience. And that is everything that we say about ourselves, either to ourselves or to another person out loud in our thoughts alone, in a journal, whatever, anything we say about ourselves is a form of self-hypnosis that is shaping our identity. Yeah. And that's going to shape the way that we show up in this world. So if you are constantly telling yourself that if you say something like, oh, I have anxiety or, oh, I'm not a confident person or, oh, I'm not good at job interviews. Mm -hmm. then guess what? Your subconscious mind is listening in. It's spying on your conversations every time. <laughs> And it hears them as truth right. when you speak it, when you speak it with conviction. And when the more conviction that you speak with, the yeah. stronger the self-hypnosis is in that moment, the more heightened the emotion and the more you speak it with conviction, the more powerful and deepened the self-hypnosis is in that moment. And guess what? So many people are walking around with this thing called limiting beliefs. Yes. Or if you believe this thing to be whatever the limiting beliefs are, we all have them. We oh, all yeah. have gods of them and we can all work through them. But yes. a limiting belief, a limiting belief is essentially a, a belief that when you continue to believe that to be true about yourself, mm -hmm. it's disempowering and it holds you back from your potential. And every time you think that thought, it is reinforcing it in your identity for it to legitimately be true about yourself. So if you're saying to yourself, I have anxiety, low confidence, I'm not good at dating. I'm not good in bed. I'm not, I'll never overcome this addiction. Uh, no one will ever love me. I'll never be, you know, all, whatever it is, the worry thoughts, the self, the self-loathing, the feelings of inadequacy, not good enough. Right. All of those disempowering thoughts for many people, it is their autopilot place where they go in their mind and they're in a constant state of self-hypnosis that reinforces and strengthens their identity of the exact thing that they don't want to have. Right. And so that in a nutshell <laughs> is self-hypnosis and how it's being used in a way all day, every day by people all over the place yeah. to reinforce the very thing that they're trying to move away from. Right. And on the flip side of it, you know, the, the opposite of a limiting belief is an empowering belief. Yeah. And the same thing holds true. Hmm. All right. If I want to be a confident person, it's, it will absolutely help if I say that I'm a confident person, but most people do affirmations wrong, which is why they hate them mm -hmm, and why mm -hmm. they don't work for most people, because you can't just write it down and expect it to work. You can't just say the words out of your mouth and expect it to work. Exactly. There, it's the emotion behind the way that you say it, the mm -hmm. emotion behind the way that you say it is gonna make all the difference in the world. So it's kind of multiple angles. Like one, we can, when we say affirmations the right way, yeah, it shifts us in the, the right direction towards an empowering uh, identity every time. Mm -hmm. It's it's more than just a matter of believing it. We, we do know that when we believe something to be true about ourselves, the way that we show up in the world is going to reflect that to be to be true. But then there's also going out in the real world and putting it to the practice, putting it like getting experience, getting experience, reinforcing it through one experience and two, your belief system. Right. And so I know I've been talking a lot, so I wanted to. <laughs> no, this has been <laughs> you, great. You, would, you know. <laughs> no, everything you said is amazing. And, it, and it's so true. Like, you know, we all go through those self-doubt, you know, we all go through those emotions where we think and we start to self-doubt ourselves about things that we know that we have, you know, that we do an amazing job with, but, but yet we tend to still self-doubt ourselves as humans. And I've noticed that the times where I've self-doubted myself, I've noticed my performance level goes down and I don't do as good of a job, even though I'm capable of doing much better. 
as soon as I self-doubt myself in anything, I could see myself not performing as well as I could, that I know that I can actually. And when you mentioned also about music and about, you know, about self-hypnosis and different ways that we perform self-hypnosis, even in daydreams, you know, uh, many times I was thinking to myself when you were saying that, you know, there are moments where even music makes me go into a self-hypnosis mode. I could put let's say songs that are are sad but they're they're beautiful songs but then i can see my emotions drifting into a into a sad mode into a a lower mode because i'm resonating with the words of the song and it's taking me from that high level high level into this low level and actually there are times when i've had to write emotional pieces and publish them and i would put these type of songs on because i knew they would draw me into that mode they would i would go from high positive into really connecting with that inner self that had gone through a lot of trauma in my life and then i would be able to write because it kind of connected me so it is crazy how the way we think the things we put in our head the music we listen to the sounds we absorb everything and there, it seems like there's so many, you know, when you think about self-hypnosis, people just think about, you know, what they see on TV, but there are many different forms as you've just proven with all these different examples that I really never stopped to really think about, you know, all these things are considered self-hypnosis. When you, when you, when you explain it in the way you did, I'm like, wow, you know what? When I did put myself in those situations, I did feel like I drifted away. I did feel separated from myself. I did feel, you know, in a, in a like kind of in, in beyond the relaxed mode, you know, kind of like you just you drifted away from your your conscious into that subconscious level of, of, of spirituality, I guess you can call it, you know, because you're, you're not no longer in the present moment. You're kind of, out of the present moment, you know, for that, for that period of time. It's pretty amazing. Absolutely. I love that you naturally just shared the insight you have with how to use music to self hypnotize <laughs> your emotional state so that you, you needed to be in a certain emotional state to have a deeper accomplishment with the thing you went out to go to go do in that moment, which is incredible. Mm -hmm. And that's the exact reason why I recommend to my clients to when you make your musical playlists, label them with the emotion, mm -hmm. have your joy playlist, have right. your confident playlist, have your motivational playlist. I like and that. ask yourself, what what emotion do I want to feel right now? What emotion do I want to feel right now? And then you say, hmm, I have a playlist for that. Let me get that going. <laughs> I have this so far. This is the best way I've discovered to make playlists. And you get to decide what emotion do I want to feel right now? Make, an, make a playlist for it. Right. Because music is one of the quickest ways for self-hypnosis to, to evoke an emotion that you want. Yeah. And we'll, we'll take it a little bit further. When there's an empowering belief that you would like to adopt because you recognize in yourself, oh, I have this disempowering belief. I have this limiting belief. Yeah. Well, you can move into an empowering belief instead. So first you have to define for yourself what that empowering belief is. Mm -hmm. And then ask yourself, hmm, when this is true, what emotion will I feel? Will I have when this is true about me? Right. Will I feel safe? Will I feel loved? Will I feel confident? Will I feel motivated? Will I feel unstoppable? Ask yourself what you're going to feel. Right. And then have a music playlist for that, the, the primary emotion that you're going to feel for that. And then when you play that playlist, now there is significantly less resistance to your subconscious mind believing your new empowering belief. This right. means that you can actually intentionally enter a state of self-hypnosis so that your subconscious mind is more open to receive the message that yeah. you and no one else chooses. You decided what your empowering belief is, and there's certain things that you can do to open up your subconscious mind to be in a place of receiving it so it doesn't reject it. Our analytical mind tends to reject the empowering beliefs. 
I like that. So we have to open up. We have to open it up to our subconscious mind to be open to suggestion. And you get to be the one to decide what you are suggestible to. Right. (laughs) And if you aren't deciding that life is going to willy nilly decide for you when you're, oh, you know, you're going to listen to music that might be disempowering or something. Right. (laughs) It seems like, you know, with, with this type, when you think about hypnosis in this sense, it actually seems like it could be healthy to go to actually practice self-hypnosis for a short period of time each day to get yourself in the mode or maybe even in the morning, right before you wake up, or even if maybe if something's going on and you have the ability to just separate yourself from the world for a few minutes to go somewhere in a quiet spot and kind of use those techniques to kind of put yourself in a, in a, in a, in a, in a, in a level that you want to be like joyful or kick-ass mode or, you know, leadership role. And, you know, and and right now you might be feeling self-doubt or upset about something, but you could actually get into a self-hypnosis, calm yourself, and then take yourself away from that and then put yourself in another labelized position where it's more positive, it seems like. Absolutely. I did that right before we started. I was feeling a little bit like low energy and all, and I'm just like, that's not how I want to show up for this podcast. Right. Pick a playlist that I put together for myself on Spotify. Mm -hmm. I love it. uh, I labeled it the revolution and it's (laughs) all music that inspires me to be purpose driven. Right. Oh, I love that. For me to be at my highest level of service to others and to be purpose driven. That's the playlist I played right before we got on. I stopped it about two minutes before I opened the zoom. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> and I'm like, all right, I tapped into my on purpose. Right. Energy. I like that. I like that. You know, I've, I've created playlists, but I'd never actually separate. I've just had a bunch of songs that I like, but I've never really separated the way you just said. And I think I'm going to do that because I like that because you really could control your emotions better. It seems because sometimes people say I have no control of my emotions. I have no control of the way I'm feeling. I can't get it together. But if you do something like that, that form of self hypnosis and you create different playlists and you get yourself, it could actually pull yourself into a whole different realm. Like we just were talking about you can go from sad to actually ha- joyful and happy just by changing the music and and actually for a few minutes go, go into your head and really absorb those sounds those words and and really make it a part of you it seems like oh absolutely absolutely and this is the reason why i've gotten so intentional about the music i allow myself to listen to while i'm yeah. driving or whatever because there may be an Adele song that comes on that is so beautiful and gorgeous. And I love Adele and her voice. And yeah. Her music is beautiful. I yeah. love it. But Me sometimes too. I'm like, whoa, I don't want to feel heartbroken right now. <laughs> yeah, I am going, I am, I'm, I like send a, I'm like, I send love out to Adele from my heart. And I'm like, all right, Adele, I love your music, but I can't listen to this. I choose yeah. not to listen to this song right now because I don't want to enter sadness. Right. Exactly. Exactly. And that's what we were talking about in the beginning of the conversation. When I mentioned that I was like, you know, I would love certain songs, but then I would, it would put me in a totally different mode, you know, as beautiful as the song may be, they're talking about broken hardness or, you know, something, you know, something about it has to be related to sadness. All of a sudden I feel my energy just being, you know, and then all of a sudden thoughts, you know, of the past or things that happened started coming to my head that related to those type of songs. And then I would see a whole different change in my, my brain, the way my thoughts were thinking, my emotions, my feelings, everything. It would change my whole body chemistry. I'm so glad you said that because when we have a specific emotion within us, then our subconscious mind is going to present us with thoughts that match the emotion. Yeah. And we are going to just be on this, uh, this thought loop train. Yeah. The entire time that emotion is present. Right. And so be extremely mindful of what you're allowing into your experience, because so much of the time we have the choice. Yes. Whether it's what you're watching on Netflix or what you're listening to on the radio or Spotify or Pandora or whatever, right? Right. Ask yourself when a certain song comes on, 
you're going to know pretty quickly what emotion it's going to evoke within you and ask yourself, is this an empowering emotion or a disempowering emotion? Yes. And then ask yourself, where do I want to be right now? In an empowered state or in a disempowered state? Right. And there are absolutely times where music that evokes maybe sadness or even anger, this healthy anger is the reason why we're allowed to set up healthy boundaries in our life. Right. And so ask yourself, we don't want to enter a rage. Yeah. Rage yeah. Is a result of years of suppressed healthy anger that we didn't feel safe to, to show. Exactly. Uh, but say you need to, uh, maybe you had a lot of suppressed emotions from the loss of a loved one. Right. Um, I know people who haven't cried after the death of their mom and yeah. everything is so suppressed inside of them. Yeah. Sometimes, you know, you got to feel it to heal it. You got to yes. feel it. To heal it. This is where sometimes those songs that make, you know, those really strong and uncomfortable emotions come up could serve a purpose. Yeah. And it helps us to feel more connected to someone that we love or right. want loved or whatever it might mean it could help with the grieving process but then there's mm. a time to move on and say I, I felt the pain immensely and deeply and now it's time for me to step into my empowered state yeah. and I'll never forget I spoke to one of my sister's friends about two years ago and the music that he listens to it evokes disempowering states within him and he mm -hmm. is almost addicted to those those style of songs and music and I asked him straight up it was obvious I said what happened what trauma did you endure as a kid yeah and he said I, I can't I can't believe you just asked me that no one's been able to see and recognize that without knowing you know said the music you listen to all this is like the food addiction that he was in yeah. and my heart went out to him. And I said, you know, as long as you keep listening to that, those songs, yeah, that they make you feel so alive and they make you feel, but they're holding you back in that disempowered state. And your, your emotions are now having thoughts that are now engaging in self hypnosis and that self hypnosis, the thoughts are going to reinforce the disempowering emotions. And yeah. it's, so whether you have the thought that produces the emotion to disempower you, or you have the challenging emotion that produces the disempowering thought, they feed on each other, one yeah. will feed the other. Mm -hmm. And every single emotion is a, a good emotion. Some yeah. are challenging. They're all mandatory. Some are challenging. It's what we do with it and how we choose to move through the challenging part. Right. And to kind of, sh you know, shorten the time frame of when we're experiencing the challenging emotions, a massive part of that is self-hypnosis, self-hypnosis, mm -hmm. self-hypnosis. How does someone that has a porn addiction, how would they use self-hypnosis to heal them, to help them? Would it have to revert back to their childhood to, to get to the point where they started, their behavior started to change and they started using addictive behaviors and, and, and kind of compensating, putting porn into their life to compensate for something that was missing or some type of, of pain that they're dealing with to try to get their own type of pleasure? Yeah. So what I teach my clients is to one, first, we have to become hyper aware. This is the part where a lot of people don't have the awareness. Yeah. Yeah. They might only have awareness of like 10% of what's going on. Right. We first have to become hyper aware of all of our disempowering thoughts. Okay. Because every disempowering thought that we have, or every, every belief that we have about ourselves on a subconscious level. Yeah. Is a disempowering thought. And then usually without our conscious awareness, we are engaging in a form of self-hypnosis to okay. reinforce the disempowering thoughts. So step one is really to become hyper aware of what all of those are. And I, I walk through a process with my clients on how to do that. And it is amazing to see their light bulb moments of awareness. Yeah. I've been doing this inner work for years and I, no one taught me this and I didn't know this and now this. And, and so there's that. And then there's converting each disempowering belief or limiting belief. Yeah. And learning how to convert it into the empowering one. And so 
in a lot of times this stuff does go back to childhood and there's a thing maybe you've heard the term called reparenting you have yes. to reparent yourself mm-hmm. and it's ultimately even if you have parents who totally loved you mm-hmm. they had flaws they our parents have flaws All, every yeah. single parent who has ever existed no matter how much love they have for their children will have exactly. flaws and they will eat things that could have been better yeah <laughs> uh, and and, and sometimes they're really extreme, like extreme trauma cases. And it's yeah. the reparenting. Part of the self-hypnosis is the reparenting process of speaking to your inner child. Mm-hmm. You could even hold a picture of yourself from when you were maybe four years old. Mm-hmm. No one on this planet can can deny that a four-year-old is worthy of receiving unconditional love and feeling right. feeling safe and like they belong in this world. Right. So sometimes as an adult, you might feel disconnected from yourself as a little kid. Yeah. When you connect to that inner child that is within all of us, it's usually easier to speak kind and loving words Yeah. to a small child who is scared and hurting than right. it is to yourself as an adult. Mm-hmm. And so it's learning to speak to yourself, to that version of yourself and speak right. self-hypnosis, use self-hypnosis as a strategy to speak to the, the little kid version of yourself that has not yet healed from the emotional wounds of the past and give them all the love in the world, make them feel so safe and so loved and use your words to do it. So yeah. some people do it through speaking out loud. Some people do it through journaling. The music helps. Mm-hmm. And- and there's different ways to do this. Um, I did this accidentally, or ex- and maybe it wasn't an accident, unintentionally, I'll say. Yeah. In, in a Dr. Joe meditation uh, retreat, I revisited myself as a four-year-old little girl and gave her just like all this love and support. Mm-hmm. And it was, in, that was a little kid version of me who was very scared um, and hurting in big ways. Yeah. And the subconscious mind doesn't know the difference between real or imaginary. It doesn't know the difference between past, present, or future. So when we, in our mind, go and revisit the little hurt version of us as little yeah. kids, mm-hmm. then it it heals us in the here and now, in the present moment. That's and such it's, a... Yeah, and it's so it's such a cool process and so healing and it's, you know, when we hear the word vulnerability, we normally just think about how it feels vulnerable to show up for another person, to have that difficult conversation with your spouse or with your kids or with your boss or your neighbor or whatever. And it's a whole new level of vulnerability happens when it's just you and yourself and no one else. (laughs) And it feels vulnerable for most people to speak love loving kindness words to yourself yeah whether it's in the present adult version of yourself or you're speaking to your inner child Mm -hmm. that inner child is the time in your in our lives when those limiting beliefs started showing up right and that's a whole new level of vulnerability that everyone needs to experience in order to level up and heal on a deeper more intimate level right and self-hypnosis is part of the game. <laughs> that sounds amazing. You know, because I think a lot of times when we go through things in life, a lot of it starts at the root. You know, it starts from our childhood and then it just, it progresses into different things. As we get older, we have other problems and it just adds up and the, like the garbage just piles up and piles up and piles up. And sometimes all those things, if you don't, if you don't address them as they happen, it just, you, you have all these repressed emotions inside you. And if you don't get them out, they just, it gets to the point. I feel like if you take so many negative emotions and you repress them, you will act out negatively, not even realizing it. And you also can become numb to other people's emotions and also not feel you, you, you sometimes you, you you know you lose track of how you feel personally you, you don't know what emotions you're feeling because you repress so many emotions you're kind of clueless and then all that anger and all those repressed emotions a lot of times people take them out on other people because they haven't dealt with them 
and it's just like a volcano getting ready to erupt. And it's just the ashes start to pop out a little bit here and there. It hasn't erupted yet, but you know, it's getting there. And, you know, I, I, you know, it's, it's something that really, once you have any, it seems like once you have any little bit of awareness, you know, you should really focus on the problem immediately and get help. You know, it's just, it, it doesn't seem like something you really should wait. It's like, cause I see, I feel like a lot of people are in denial and, and people do not want to address the problem because, you know, fear and change are, are two worst enemies, you know, and how do you break through that? You know, some people might know in the back of their head that they have a problem, but they stay in denial or they're too fearful to address it, or they're afraid of change because they don't know what's going to happen once they change. And how do you address all those things? Yeah, this is such a good question. And essentially, there's the reason why someone avoids diving into the inner work. It's it can be kind of one of two reasons. Mm -hmm. So when someone is feeling like kind of what you were saying, when someone is kind of emotionally numb, yeah. when they're emotionally numb to other people, they're also emotionally numb to themselves. Yeah. And that is a trauma response where the subconscious mind is tapped out. It's in overwhelm. Yeah. There's fight, flight, or freeze. It's a freeze response, which creates apathy. Yeah. No one is motivated in a state of apathy. So no one's motivated towards change or making things better or problem solving when they're in a state of apathy. Mm -hmm. And so that's one, one side of it. The other side, when someone also, which is also a trauma response is the exact opposite, yeah. a hypersensitivity to an emotional response. And you're hypersensitive to your own emotions and to other people's emotions. In these, I call super feelers, yeah. which are also usually the strongest empaths mm -hmm. are super feelers from it's a trauma response, but empathy is also a great gift, but it can be a double-edged sword because you can be so emotionally sensitive to everyone around you. Yeah. And if everyone around you isn't in an amazing mood, you're going to feel whatever they're feeling. Yeah, exactly. And, yeah. And so that means their own fear towards recovery might be an extremely heightened sensitive response. So mm -hmm. someone might be feeling a very heightened sensitive fear response or apathy, which is no motivation to do anything. Right. And, you know, there's usually something that comes along in someone's life that says, okay, I'm making a decision now. Mm -hmm. When technically anyone can make the decision now, that's not really how life works for most people is we yeah. have to have something jarring enough in our life like yeah. a hot, some hot poker that says the time is now. Yeah. And what that's going to look like is going to be different for everyone. Right. It might be the death of a loved one. And you know that you, life is so precious and so short. And we're only here for such a short, short, short amount of time. And you don't want to waste another ounce of your life, another second of your life living the way that you have. And you know, you need to make some change. Yeah. Or maybe you're having that numbed out response and something comes along that allows you to feel again. Yeah. And it's in that's the moment that you make that decision. Cause it's a decision. Every time it's a decision, right? Anyone can decide any moment of any day. And the thing, you know, we all have our hot pokers that, <laughs> <laughs> that jar us into the decision-making process. Yeah. And that looks like is going to be so different for everyone. Each person's rock, rock bottom will look different. Right. Each person's threshold will look different. Right. And there are certain things to help that along, you know, there's you know, meditation, prayer, breath work, um, starting to engage in some self-hypnosis, just making new and different choices, like going for a walk for 10 minutes a day, even if that's not something that you do right now, right. Getting out of your normal routine. Right. And that, that could even be a good stepping stone. Get out of your normal routine with mm -hmm. something that's not as scary or big or as intimidating as addiction recovery. Yeah. Hmm. Different. Therefore it'll be maybe a little challenging, but it's not as scary as doing jumping into that deep inner work. 
Right. Let me get a gym membership and actually go. Right. Uh, you know, let me do, you know, there's so many different things that it could be. Yeah. So, okay. Now I'm training my brain to say yes to new and different things. Mm -hmm. I'm training my brain to say yes to new and different things. And discipline is always a choice. Yes. Motivation is something we can learn to create and cultivate within us. But discipline is always a choice. Yes, it is. And it so, seems like we could also compensate like our addictive behaviors. We can, we can also learn to break them by actually trying by stopping certain behaviors and substituting them with positive things like you mentioned and, you know, slowly focusing on, on a, on a healthy living way, you know, on a way that we could, we could live more healthier and, you know, and try not to focus on those addictive behaviors by putting something else in our life and putting, or adding a few different things in our life. Now, when it comes to porn, when people, you know, just like alcohol or drug addiction, when they have that urge to want to go back to it, what do you tell them? What do you suggest to them? It's kind of, it's like a relapse in a sense, it's just like alcohol or a food addiction. It's, it's a relapse. So how do you, how do you help someone when it comes to relapse? You know, can you incorporate self-hypnosis into trying to help someone with relapse? Or maybe we should just focus on the relapse part first. Yeah. Self-hypnosis is a powerful tool and strategy that someone can use because essentially when we want to remove anything from our life, whether it's a behavior, a self-sabotaging thought, a limiting belief, whatever it is, we can't just have that thing exit our life and create a vacuum. Yeah. We have to fill it with something, a new thought, a mm -hmm. new activity, a new choice a new person, yeah. whatever it's going to be, right? Yeah. And so it's being really intentional about what those are. Right. And one thing that is really common out there in the world when someone is trying to overcome addiction is people do something called um, addiction switching or hopping or dopamine switching. Okay. This is, it's a really dangerous, but really common thing. It's usually one of the reasons why people will switch from one 12 step program to the next. I overcame um, alcoholism, but now I'm a porn addict. I overcame porn addiction, but now I'm a gambling addict. I overcame gambling addiction, but now I'm a food addict. Yeah. And so it's incredibly important that the replacement activity is not another escapism behavior. Yeah. It's not just that easy button into let me escape my reality. It's something, so there's something called earned dopamine versus mm -hmm. junk food version of dopamine. So we get rid of all of our junk food version of dopamine, which yeah. could be, you know, actual junk food, video games, porn, gambling, booze, right. hard drugs, like whatever, you name it, right? Yeah. Escapisms, we call them escapisms, where you're trying to escape the difficulty of your reality rather than being solutions oriented about it. Right. And so in that, that urge to relapse, instead of replacing it with just some other cheap hit of dopamine activity, it's doing something called earned dopamine. Right. Which means, Hey, maybe I'm going to go for a jog and I'm going to get the same neurochemicals in my brain and the reward system as watching porn. Yeah. But now I have I've earned it, which is going to strengthen my neurology towards discipline, towards motivation. And now I can, over time, it's it's essentially getting the same neurochemical fix, Yeah, but through a way that takes effort. Mm -hmm. We call this intentional limbic friction, mm -hmm. a term coined by neurobiologist, Dr. Andrew Huberman, and so the, the intentional limbic friction is a part of it with the replacement activities. Yeah. But on the other side, we don't, a lot of uh, misconceptions around addiction recovery. A lot of people think as long as I just um, do this disciplined activity and then do this disciplined activity and do this disciplined activity, then I'll be fine. And they just fill their day with disciplined activities and they try to make it their routine and try to stay busy and they neglect the most important part. Right or equally as important, most important part, healing the emotional wounds of the past, those yep. trauma wounds of the past, 
because every addiction is merely a symptom of unresolved trauma. Yes. And then the subcon the subconscious mind with addiction, the subconscious mind goes, I feel unsafe in this world. I feel insecure. I feel unlovable, unworthy, whatever it might be, all those self-hypnotic limiting beliefs. Yeah. And then the subconscious mind goes, let's escape this feeling. Mm -hmm. Go grab that bottle of booze. Go watch that porn. Go gamble. Go binge on YouTube or Netflix. Go yeah. scroll Facebook. Go, you know, it's all of these escapism behaviors. Mm -hmm. And when you heal the emotional wounds of the past, you begin to create an internal neurology within you that no yeah. longer feels the need to escape. Do you feel that um, addiction is more of a, a learned behavior or is it something that triggers in the brain? Because, it, you know, when you see, sometimes you see addiction, it runs in the family, you know? So is that learned because you're in the environment and you, you pick it up or just like smoking, they have a certain chemical that when you smoke a cigarette, it triggers something in the brain where a person immediately becomes addicted to it. So we have an area in our brain that could cause, it can be triggered and cause addictiveness. So can, is it when they do studies, do you happen to know if a lot of times this is more of a, a, a switch in the brain where certain things are triggered, you know, um, because your brain just works as everybody's brain works a certain way, or is it because you're in a be in an environment where you see people in your family with this addictive behavior, you know, behave, you know, so what do you think, or is it a little of both? Yeah. Um, it could be a little bit of both, but a, I love this question, by the way, thank <laughs> you for this question. The, the bigger part of the answer, the part that has a stronger effect on us mm -hmm. is not going to necessarily be just by being in an environment and watching someone else do it, but that will absolutely have an impact, mm -hmm. but it doesn't necessarily mean that's how you're going to be. Right. Um, for example, it, sometimes it could help a person to be the exact opposite because now you witness how it destroys a person and you say to yourself with such conviction, I will not do that. Yes. Why I have some of my aunts who don't drink any alcohol because my grandfather, which was their father was an alcoholic. Right. Um, but there's going back to the other point, essentially when someone is experiencing a hardship or they don't feel good, they feel there's a lot of stress or anxiety or depression or feelings of inadequacy, low self-worth, low self-compassion, you name it, all these things that are disempowering to us. Yeah. And then someone comes across something maybe it's pornography or alcohol or cocaine or yeah sugary sweets mm -hmm. and sometimes it's also a person when a you know addictive codependency relationships we can have get this is what I fell into this very strongly yeah and all of a sudden you have this experience with a, with a person or a substance or an experience and it creates the reward inside of your brain, mm -hmm. the dopamine reward, it skyrockets. And then wow. the brain says, the brain pays extra attention to that and said, ooh, that felt good. Mm -hmm. You need to remember this. Right. Let's, let's uh, continue to experience this over and over. And now it creates, now your subconscious mind says, ooh, let's motivate you to go and do that thing again to go spend more time with that person or drink that thing or watch those types of videos or take that drug. Yeah. And now you're developing strong neural pathways towards that one specific thing. And now that's a slippery slope to addiction. I see. That says, oh, this, when we do that thing, we feel better than when we don't do that thing. Let's keep doing that thing. Let's create all of the neurochemicals and thoughts to give you extreme motivation to go seek that thing and bring it into your experience over right. and over and over. Gotcha. Wow. And that, go yeah. ahead. And so I think I may have shared this on the previous episode of one of the things that eventually domino affected into my hypersexuality disorders when I was, I want to say maybe 14 years old and I was walking across the Fox River Bridge in Illinois, a truck drove by and the two men in the truck whistled at my cousin and I, and we were each wearing like short shorts, halter tops. And yeah, 
subconscious mind, I had a, it was a, a neurochemical high, a dopamine high, a rush. Yeah. And my subconscious mind goes, oh, this is how you're valuable. Mm -hmm. Go and seek that experience over and over. This right. is how you're worth something. And so there's so many different things that we all have in our life. Yeah. That, you know, it's a, a preference turned extreme. Yeah. <laughs> Maybe that's a bad way to put it, but it's like, um, it's a way to provide neurochemicals of uh, safety and winning and leveling up as our subconscious yeah. goes, this is how we survive. Right. This is how we we're either loved or how it contributes to our survival. And it's the same neurochemicals, even though it's a false cue. Yeah. It seems like we have to really work on our, our self-worth and try to really work on a high, higher self-esteem and self-worth of ourselves so we don't fall back into that barrel and, and those addictive behaviors and those negative you know, habits it don't form like they do, you know, like they easily can do. You know, it seems like it's something that we really have to practice every day, you know. Yeah. And when we heal from those emotional wounds of the past, it helps. It, I mean... Those emotional wounds of the past from our childhood, they give us feelings of unworthiness, not good mm -hmm. enough, inadequate. This creates things like either perfectionism or why even try because I'll never be good enough. Yeah. Or all of these things. And essentially, when we were born, we didn't have those beliefs about ourselves. No. It was life experiences from how other people responded to us. Yes. When we were very young, mm -hmm. that that essentially, you know, injected that into our identity, that yeah. formulated our identity. Right. Because we are always in a hypnotic state when we're under seven years old. Basically the first seven years of life, the human brain is in a highly, highly hypnotic state, like the entire time. Yeah. And so what those little kids, what we as kids experience is going to shape their identity so even mm -hmm. things like if a you know if a six-year-old boy hears something like oh boys don't cry now when he has a very valid emotion that brings on tears he feels like something is wrong with him right these are just little examples that are common examples and now he yeah. feels like something is wrong with him and he's scared to show his real self Right. Now he might go on to have um, confidence issues. When any child who's not confident, there's some emotional trauma going on. Yeah. Shyness is not a, a healthy trait. It's, right. a, it's a sign of some emotional wound healing that needs to take place. Right. I agree. That's what shyness, when a, when a kid is shy, that child does not feel safe in their world. They have not been loved unconditionally on some level. Right. That's very interesting. I, I agree a hundred percent with you. You definitely, it all goes back to the your childhood years. And, mm -hmm. and I, I would agree those first seven years are very valuable and, and very important in your life. Now, if you had to take everything we talked about today and add to give our, our listeners some takeaways, what would you emphasize from everything that we talked about today? Oh yeah. First I would say, be extremely mindful of every single thought that you have, every thought. And this concept I learned from Dr. Joe Dispenza, and it was just be so awake and aware that no thought slips past your mind without your awareness. Be aware because when we're aware, then we can stop it in its tracks if it's not a thought that serves us. Right. So we have to learn how to become aware of our own thoughts mm -hmm. because an enormous amount of all day, every day for most people is on a, an unconscious autopilot. Right. And that lack of awareness is just pretty detrimental. <laughs> yeah, for sure. A hundred percent. So start paying attention to your own thoughts. Learn how to identify when they're disempowering. You can 
pay attention to the emotional response it has within you. Do you feel mm -hmm. empowered or disempowered? Right. Exactly. Yeah. And just no matter who we are and where we're going in life and where we've come from, we all have an inner journey to go on to mm -hmm. level up. And it's a choice to go on that inner journey. And right. you will be a leveled up human being <laughs> when mm -hmm. you choose to say yes to that, no matter who you are, where you are, where you're going, where you've been. <laughs> <laughs> I like that. I like that. Now, can you tell everybody um, some of the services you provide and where they can find you? Absolutely. So I have the most, as of right now, the world's most comprehensive online porn addiction recovery program for men. There's about 50 hours of online core, uh, essentially lessons that you can go through at your own time. Everything's lifetime access. I also host once a week Bravery Bootcamp for two hours. It's a small group coaching session for any of my clients to show up and we do wins and celebrations. And then any question you have, you can ask and everyone gets to chime in if they want to, to help answer. And it's amazing because Ooh, this is where the magic happens. When you hear the win of someone else with the same challenge you're going through, right? the mirror neurons in your brain light up and ex you experience it as a win as well. And you deepen your healing process and you accelerate it when you, when you do this with other people. And so part of it is like that group setting. And then the other part is the deep inner work where you do at home alone with no one else around. And you're just with your own thoughts yeah. going to those places. And so that's part of it. Um, and I have other aspects of it as well. My website is selfcraftedking.com. Selfcrafted because you and only you mm -hmm. decide who you want to be. All parts of your identity. I so self-crafted. And then king selfcraftedking.com. King is for two reasons. King, because you are the ruler of your own life. Addiction is no longer controlling or ruling you. Mm -hmm. And then also a king is always of service to others. And part of the recovery healing journey is stepping up to the plate to be of service to others. This is right. innate in the human experience. Every single one of us, when we are at our best and when we love life and live life to the fullest and get the deepest satisfaction must and always involve being of service to others. Right. And so a king is always of service to others. So selfcraftedking.com. I have um, free access to start the online course. You can just put your name and email in there. And then if you also want to take it a step further, you can book a free call with one of my coaches to ask any questions you have. And it's mandatory to do the one hour commitment steps, which is mm -hmm. the intro of my course, mm -hmm. before being on a call. And that's because we really just want to make sure that before we carve out an hour of our time to talk to you, we want to make sure that you've first carved out an hour of your time to learn some of the bare bone essentials of your recovery journey before we, we want to say that you're committed. Right. We want to say you're committed. When we see that, we will love to hop on a call with you. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. This has been amazing. Thank you so much, Jessica. I love everything you provided today. All the information was amazing. I just, I, I learned so much about self-hypnosis. I probably, I learned from you more than I've learned from any, anybody else. And really it's, it's been an amazing time. Thank you so much for coming on the show today. And everyone don't forget that Jessica has her own podcast on our channel. So check it out. And thank you so much for sharing all this valuable information. I love it. You're so welcome. And thank you for having me. Oh, you're very welcome. You have a great day. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.